Hello there. My name is Denise Cooper, and I am the founder of Intersource Commons. And uh, I'm going to kick off this Intersource 101 with some introductory slides just to level set so that everybody's sort of talking about the same thing when they talk about Intersource. Um, so, first of all, this is uh, the man who coined the term, that is uh, Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Media. And um, he came up with this term inner source to describe using open source methods inside a firewall or inside a proprietary organization. And he came up with this idea in 2000, sort of not too long after open source was coined as a term. And uh, he was involved in the founding of a company that was going to teach this to people, except it was a difficult sell because people were really skeptical about open source. I mean, Frankly, for a long time, we did not know that it was going to succeed. And so it was really easy for the people that didn't want to see change happen to just come in and say, you, you know, we're not going to pay attention to this. It's never going to work. But um, they eventually pivoted to some different work. They sort of stopped trying to teach this, which I thought was really sad. And um, But I understood it. It was because open source wasn't a proven concept yet. And then we won. And about six years ago, I started working for PayPal. And they hired me to work on open source with them. But when I got into the company, I realized that the reason that they weren't doing open source was because they didn't understand how to collaborate internally. Their engineering resources were all tied up in excessive ownership culture. And excessive ownership culture means that the engineers in their company were still in the salt mines. They were not working in a transparent, nurturing, uh, open source way. And when I say nurturing, I mean engineers that learn to work this way have a much better work-life balance. They have better, better feelings about their work. They're empowered. They're not beaten down by it generally. I mean, it's, it's, Considering that programmers are creative people, it's a much more natural way to work. So I got interested in trying to get the engineers in the world out of the salt mines because a small percentage of engineers get to work as open source engineers. And it wouldn't it be great if everybody could work that way. And that's what InterSource has the potential to do. So in excessive ownership culture, you end up with silos. Everybody probably watching this has worked in a company at one time or another where there were silos of code, where only a few people knew how to make those silos work. And it was like their special job to make that happen. And in some cases, they think they're better than all the other people in the company, especially if they work on a really important silo. Um, but silo uh, organization is almost never actually good for the organization. It can seem like it's going to be good at the beginning because people are going to take ownership and they're going to have more pride in their work. But over time, when you let the same group of people work inside a closed system, what ends up happening is cruft enters the picture. Um, code uh, debt or technical debt enters the picture because usually people have way more to do than they actually have time for. They have to make choices. And often it's it's easy to choose not to pay attention to you know organizational issues within the code, for instance, refactoring, uh, modularization. There's lots of things that gets left by the wayside. This is because of excessive ownership culture and long-term silos. And in this picture, obviously, all that stuff is denoted by the rust in the silos. Um, so another problem that people uh, that brings people to Intersource is bottlenecks. It's related to the silo thing, but if you have engineers who are sending requests for features and then waiting around and not do not being productive because they're blocked until they get that thing to happen, then you've got a bottleneck problem, and you're not using your resources fully, and you've also got frustrated engineers. Um, if you're in an agile shop, then they're encouraged to work on other stuff while they're waiting. But often, you know, they'll get blocked three or four ways, and and then it becomes like a domino effect. They can't get anything done until the first thing gets done because dependencies are real. 
So um, this is another reason that people turn to Intersource and there has been some real success at getting these bottlenecks to be reduced when you apply Intersource correctly. And then the last leading reason that people come to Intersource is because they are locked into a way of thinking or behaving across the engineering organization that is not allowing them to innovate. And so this picture is an example of, you know, an army where everybody walks in the same way. There are a couple of really large companies that have successfully used Intersource as a way to foster more innovation within the company, which is really exciting. And obviously it instantly creates value so that um, everybody can understand why in resource this break from the norm pattern is uh, an acceptable alternative to create an innovation. And then there's a reason that not many companies are thinking about yet, but it's going to become a big deal soon. And that is the fact, the simple fact, that at the low end of the cost structure for hiring engineers are the new kids. And the new kids have just gotten out of school or they never went to school, but they're hot shots. Here's the thing, all of the new kids that you can hire now have grown up as digital natives. They're used to the internet, they're used to open source existing, and they both expect more transparency and more agency in work than previous generations did. And that means they're not going to be happy in old fashioned cultures and they'll leave. So, you know, if the time and energy that you put into selecting candidates and hiring is computed as value, then keeping them from leaving just because they're frustrated by the methods is probably worth doing. And I think more and more this is going to be how everybody has to learn to work. But for now, it's still only front runner companies that are getting out in front of it. And yours could be one of them. So a lot of companies go out and get GitHub Enterprise, because they want to modernize their engineering. And whether they know the words for it or not, what they're looking for is the inner source effect. But the inner source effect is not just about a tool. It's not just about making the code transparent across your organization. It takes more than that to get the collaboration that we're talking about to really happen. And so the rest of this presentation talks about some of those challenges. GitHub is a fine tool. I don't mean to knock it. It's actually really easy to do intersource with GitHub and some elbow grease. But right now there is no tool that is an end-to-end -to -end tooling for intersource outcomes. And so we'll talk about that some more as we go through these points. But first I wanted to um, show you the intersource logo because I really like it. It, it looks like it denotes the eye but also like there's a party inside there. And that's how it feels if you have been in the salt mines and you suddenly get to work in Intersource. So um, Intersource is a people's movement. In a lot of companies, it actually starts at, at the engineering level as a grassroots effort. It seems to spring up a, a lot around continuous integration and deployment efforts because that is coming from scratch. Every company has to write it from scratch to fit its own you know, situation. And there's a huge opportunity there to promote code reuse instead of having every facet of the com company you know, invent new stuff. So thinking about how to work with people is a big part of what we do in Intersource. Why are people not collaborating now? What's in the way of their collaboration? Um, are they matrixed? In other words, are the accountants running the company really? Because literally every single person's every second is somehow tied to you know the p and l silo that they're in. Silos are not only for code, they're also for people. They're also for practices. And um, Intersource is about examining all of that and seeing if that it really has the value or delivers on the value that it promised. So when matrix management comes in, the value proposition is we're going to absolutely know if we're getting every you know, speck of value out of every employee. But actually, it makes it really hard for people to justify collaboration outside of their immediate sphere. And that's not what we want anymore. We don't want that over-specialization and over-ownership um, culture uh, silo thing. What we want is more cross-collaboration, more full-stack knowledge, 
more people taking responsibility for the quality of the whole product, not just the little morsel that they're looking at. And to do that, you need to think about people. You also need to think about transparency. Everything needs to be transparent. This is a given in open source because everything's public, but in inner source, it's transparency inside the organization. So most of the companies that don't have transparency before they get a hold of GitHub Enterprise or GitLab or even Bitbucket has been used successfully to do inner source, generally they had some older tool that wasn't any of those three. And then they go with the new tool to increase collaboration, but they go ahead and copy all of the stuff that it was set up before, all the little walls around all the code, because they think, well, those walls must be there for a reason. Yeah, they're there because that's what supports the silo. If you're trying to get rid of the siloing, it behooves you to open the code to everybody across the company. There will always be people in your company that don't want to do that. And if you really look at why, you may find that their code is crap and they know it. They don't want anybody to look at it. They'll always tell you that it's because they're the secret sauce. So it's good if you have some high level architect or somebody review all of this stuff when that those claims are made, because they usually have the right to look at anybody's code. And they often are surprised when they really look into it. Now, this slide is meant to invoke the fact that beyond the kids that are just getting out of college now are the next generation of programmers that you're going to hire. And even more than people you can hire today, these kids are growing up with a desire to see everybody do well, all the boats to rise, and a fair amount of just sort of altruistic sharing that does not match ownership culture. So I see fewer and fewer children, you know, throwing tantrums because somebody touched their toy. Um, I'm seeing kind of a global kid shift away from that towards sharing. And it's kind of amazing, but it bodes very well for the future of Intersource in these companies because they'll want to work with each other in all of these ways. So I think it's important to remember that it's not just about us. But if you're looking at long-term thinking, it's about a couple of generations from now. And how, how easy will it be for them to get interested in a given code base and just start contributing to it? How well documented is it? How, easy, how modular is the code? There's lots of pieces to this puzzle once you really get into it and think about it holistically across a whole organization. Because like open source, inner source is at the end of the day really people. This, by the way, is, um, is a little bit of a much larger crowd um, meeting to talk about Drupal. This, they started with like 10 people, and now look at them. Um, and that phenomenon of growth will happen in your company if you let it. I just listened to a whole day of people for taping these things, talking about what happens when open, when inner source is adopted and takes off like wildfire. How do you keep up with the scale of it? I'm really excited every time I hear one of those stories because at the beginning we were having to carry it along so carefully, so deliberately, but it's starting to become the snowball that I thought it would. And soon it's gonna be covering the whole world. Truthfully, I think that's where we're going. And that's what I'm hoping for. Because at the moment that we tip the balance and most engineers work this way, we're going to start seeing technology take a great leap forward, another great leap, because collaboration with that many minds can only reveal more interesting stuff than what we're getting now, where everything is about head-to-head, -head, no, no code reuse, and head-to-head -head, um, non-collaboration uh, competition on the same pieces or the same functionality written over and over again. Um, it's a huge waste of human capital, the way that things are being done now. These are some of the companies that agree with me in saying that. These are companies that are talking publicly about their inner source practice. And every day we uncover new ones. I just, I just learned about uh, Intuit having a huge inner source practice. It's really gratifying because I talked to them about it like five years ago, and then I never heard from them again. It's not important that they include me. What's important is they get this benefit. So 
I want to draw your attention to just a couple of companies on this page that I think are really interesting. One of them is Microsoft up there in the left-hand corner. Microsoft is a company that historically really did not like open source. It, it was a threat to their business model. They were very unhappy about it. And over time, that has changed. In order to get Azure to work as a project that was going against some of the other clouds, they felt like they had to do something different. And they did a lot of recruiting from the Apache Software Foundation to gain that expertise from the outside. And so Azure has been run as an open source project, basically. And now Microsoft is looking at the successes of Azure and the difference between that and the rest of their products. And they're starting to assertively teach InnerSource inside the company to the rank and file engineers, not just the Azure engineers, so that they so that everybody gets this lift. Everybody comes to understand why open source one and how to be more proactive about doing the right things in open source for Microsoft. And I think that's really a great 360 story of the long road of open source coming, bringing them back around through InnerSource to collaboration. The other company that I want to talk to you about is Comcast NBC Universal, that is pretty close to Microsoft. And the reason they're interesting to me is they've got this pattern, which we're now hearing over and over again. Whenever a team wants to open source something at Comcast, they're first required to build an inner source community for that project because it gives them practice at how to externalize their ideas and their messaging and how to step back from owning to leading or allowing the, the project to go forward as a collaborative effort. And we think that this is a great pattern. It's a great idea to, I mean, Comcast already did a lot of open source, but to get more out of their open source efforts, figuring out how to collaborate before the team goes outside and tries to engage with the public is a great way to make sure that future Comcast projects in open source have the best chance of winning. So we really like that pattern because that's kind of why I started it. I, again, I wanted to see PayPal have a more meaningful relationship with open source, not just using it, but collaborating and contributing back. And um, likewise, I want to see all engineers have that opportunity. So this is InterSource Commons. Um, you're going to hear a lot about that in this, this session uh, of 101, because most of the people that are speaking in this session really love InterSource Commons as a place to get together with other people who are learning how to do InterSource together. My theory here is that it's nobody's secret sauce. I mean, maybe it should be GitHub's. But um, GitHub's and GitLab's, you know. But in general, it's just a better way of doing things, and it's not, you know, somebody's competitive advantage exclusively. In fact, if everybody does it, everybody does better with their engineering. So, InterSource Commons is a place where everybody gets together and has real conversations about what they're running into, what they're seeing, what they don't understand, and we do this under Chatham House rules. So it's possible to ask a question, a real question, without being worried about the answer doing brand damage to you in the public space. Basically, we all promise each other that we will not have, um, we will not use social media to shame each other around the questions that we're asking. And so far, six years in, people are really honoring that still. It's, it's very refreshing and I'm starting to see and it's, um, Chatham House rules show up in some other open source projects, and that's kind of exciting too. Okay, so that is my first set of slides about the wonderful party that is InterSource and the reasons that you guys might want to get involved. And um, this, of course, is a session that is being prepared as an introduction for people that are coming for the first time to these ideas. So hopefully, I've touched enough of the common themes that you can see yourself in the future of this. I hope that's true and that you'll come and join us. But now I'm going to run through another set of slides, which are going to give you the sort of top level drawing that I usually do about how InterSource works.